this really must be a tremendous moment for a man who's obviously loving every second of today's sail. Any second now, the black rock beacon stretching out across the water from Tendennis Point will come into view just on the left of your picture. And the cannon is gone. The cannon has gone. The hooters, the horns, the salute. Day 312, about 25 past three on April the 22nd. And Robin Knox Johnson and Sue Haley have sailed non-stop around the world. So Robin Knox Johnson is probably the most determined, most stubborn, most interesting person I've ever met in my entire life. Uh, to me, Sir Robin Knox Johnson is an iconic figure and, and one of the greatest sailors to have ever set foot in a boat. The thing that made Robin stand out so much at the time was that he wasn't well known, he wasn't famous, he, he was an ordinary chap who'd built his own boat and done something that nobody on earth had ever done before through sheer guts and drive and determination. He created that first non-stop sail around the world that nobody thought was possible, hadn't been done until he completed it. And he's laid that pathway for all of us to follow. On the 22nd of April, 1969, Robin Knox Johnston, an officer in the British Merchant Navy, completed an incredible feat, becoming the first person in history to sail around the world, non-stop and alone. He began his adventure in July 1968, departing from Falmouth in southwest England, returning there after 312 days of solitude. He was a changed man, both physically and mentally, and he had sailed into the history books by completing a feat that at the time, most people thought was simply impossible. And it not only changed his life completely, but enabled him to go on and create a legacy that has changed the lives of thousands of people around the world. Robin was born in Southwest London, just six months before the Second World War broke out. His father was then posted to Liverpool, where Robin's early years were spent. We were living up on the Wirral during the war, so I was looking down at the D, particularly as we got towards D Day, there was a lot of activity. Pre people practicing for the landings over beaches and that sort of thing. And so one got very interested, of course, small boy, what you expect? Five years old and all these chaps coming down with large bits of machinery, it's wildly exciting. And the boats and everything else. So by the age of eight, I basically decided I was going to see. Robin quit school while taking his final exams so he could follow his dream of going to sea, joining as an apprentice in the British Merchant Navy. There he learnt to sail and enjoyed a successful career, but in his late twenties found inspiration through a British yachtsman, Francis Chichester. He followed his story as Chichester sailed around the world on his own in 1967. He stopped just once in Australia during his circumnavigation, and so set a new record in this time of adventure and exploration. BBC correspondent and longtime friend of Robin recalls Chichester's achievement. I lived in, in Greenwich at that time. I'd just started working for the BBC. I joined the BBC in 1966, and uh, Sir Francis Chichester came of course, to Greenwich um, uh, in his in his boat, and uh, I think the Queen met him there, knighted him there. Francis Chichester was an established character. Uh, he, he was a famous sailor. Robin was a a, a young man. Most of us uh, had, had never never heard of him or any of the other people that went on that round the world race in 1969. And Robin lifted himself out of the, the, the mass by simple, his simple daring and ability and guts and drive. Robin's life in the Merchant Navy saw him travel the world too, away from home for many months at a time. 
I went to India when I was still an apprentice in my last year, um, during one of the company ships going out east. Came home, took my second mate certificate, and you had a choice. I could stay on home line, ships running from the UK out to Africa and India, or I could go on Eastern service, which was ships based out east, I mean, built in Britain, but never came home. And I decided I'd go on Eastern service because the pay was better. I joined Walker in, uh, in Karachi and went on the Gulf run, where I spent the next four years going from Bombay to Basra and back and calling it all the ports in between. His childhood sweetheart, Sue, was patient and was always in his mind on long journeys. We grew up together. And, um, you know, when she got to about 17, I was 19, I was, oh, pretty good looking, that one. Um, so my interest in her changed from the tomboy friend to more romantic. And we got married uh, about three years later. Went out to India. So, uh, yeah, she was 20, I was 22. Their daughter, Sara, was born while they were living in India. But due to his career in the Navy, she was often left alone looking after their baby for long periods. However, India also proved to be the birthplace of an idea, one that would soon affect all their lives. His now famous yacht, called Suheili, was built in Bombay using a design based on a Norwegian lifeboat. It's a Bermudan ketch with two masts and is just 32 feet in length. Two of his fellow officers joined in his plan to build her, but pulled out after problems and delays. The three of us talking about what name to use. Um, and Suheili came to us because there's a star called Suhail. But Suheili also has a number of meanings. It can mean girlfriend or best friend in Urdu. And my wife's name was Sue, so it seemed to me quite tactful to choose the name Suheili. Financially, it was a bit tricky because the other two decided that was enough. They wanted to go out to Australia and New Zealand and marry their girlfriends. I didn't want to give up, and so I basically bought them out. We were living on next to nothing at the time. I mean, we were living on porridge for breakfast, bananas for lunch. One of six was with a curry for dinner, so it got very slim. Go away, losing weight. With finances stretched, a young child and his ever-evolving plan to sail Sue Haley back to Britain with his family, it proved a difficult time for their relationship, and eventually they drifted apart. Well, she was worried because, um, you know, there was quite a lot of disease, and Sarah was premature, about five weeks premature. So Sue was terrified if she got ill, she, she'd lose everything. So, I mean, she fed her up to the point she looked like Buddha, uh, but she was always worried about her health. So she wasn't at all keen on coming on the boat. By this time, I was committed financially to the boat. I couldn't get out of it. So that created frictions, which uh, eventually ended with the splitting up. Well, we never fought over Sarah. That was always, we always very civilized with each other over that. So anyway, I bought them out, came home, uh, took my master's ticket, went into the Navy for five months, went back out with my brother and a friend, finished the boat off, and we sailed for England around the Cape. Got to Durban, we'd missed the season to get around the Cape, we'd run out of money anyway. So the next three months, I was captain of a ship going up and down the South African coast, which was great fun. Earned enough money to buy some tins, and we decided we'd go from Cape Town to London non-stop. You know, we'd gone on long enough, we wanted to get home. So we did, it took us 77 days. Um, but actually, it was extremely useful experience. Francis Chichester's achievement in 1967 had stayed with Robin and it ignited a burning desire. I saw Chichester come home and thought he's gone around the world single-handed with one stop. There's one thing to be done and it just grew on me to the point where I realized I was gonna to have to do it. I wrote to 52 companies and said you know I've got this great idea I need uh, 5,000 pounds to do it will you sponsor me and they wrote back and said no. But I did get a five pound voucher out of Cadbury's, so it wasn't totally wasted. The idea of a solo non-stop circumnavigation was popular at the time, however, and so the Sunday Times newspaper created what they called the Golden Globe Race and offered a five thousand pound prize purse to the winner, enough to buy a family-sized house. The Sunday Times decided the race would start on the 31st of October. Myself, John Ridgway and Shea Blythe have 
well, we're not starting then. We're going to start in June. And they couldn't understand why we wanted to start in June. And the reason is, the one place you don't want to hang around in the winter is Cape Horn. If we start in midsummer here, we'll get off Cape Horn in midsummer in the Southern Hemisphere, which is a sensible time to be there. So all of us said, well, sorry, we're going in June. The Sunday Times very sharp. They said, uh, we won't be able to be in, in, our, in our race then. I don't know what the other suit said. And I said, no, you're catching on fast. So they had to change the rules, which meant you could start from the 1st of June to the 31st of October. But then they thought, well, to encourage people to go fast, we'll put a money prize up. The person who gets around fastest starting between those two dates. I never actually entered the Sunday Times Golden Globe race. They announced on my birthday in 1968 that I was, a, I was an entrant, along with three others that they knew about at the time. But I never actually entered. Now back in Britain and in need of finance, he rejoined the Merchant Navy, while also focusing on his plans, preparing for the biggest challenge of his life, a race into the unknown. Long sea voyages can be fraught with danger and uncertainty, but venturing out into the mists of a massive expanse of ocean, completely alone, at the mercy of Mother Nature, demands a certain mentality. Offshore sailor Alex Thompson's career was launched after Robin appointed him as the youngest skipper in the Clipper 1998 race. Alex was just 25 years old then, but now he is recognised as one of the leading stars in the sport. Robin was the person who took the risk and the responsibility for me to, to start this whole process. Maybe he recognised something in me or... or uh, I, I, I don't know, but he gave me an opportunity that I don't think most people would have done. And the Clip Around the World race gave me the opportunity to show what my capability was. And if, if I hadn't have, if Robin hadn't taken me on the trial, I wouldn't have got a job with Clipper. If I hadn't got a job with Clipper, I wouldn't have won the Clipper Around the World race in 98-99. And I would not have met Sir Keith Mills. So my life would be completely different now if it, if it wasn't for Robin. When you're out in the ocean racing in these solo races, whether it be non-stop or stopping, I love it. I, I mean, everybody would feel differently about it, but for me, I love the feeling, the freedom. I love, uh, you know, that, that uh, humbling feeling you have from being out there in a big ocean and being such a small, tiny person. Um, but I think we all feel differently about it. We obviously feel, we can feel isolated, we can feel lonely, we can feel uh, stress from the risk. And, and as time goes on, the technology gets better, that gets easier. So back in 1968, 1969, how would you know it was going to come? I, as far as I was aware, they'd only just worked out that the Earth was round, hadn't they? Dee Kafari is the first woman to have sailed single-handed and non-stop around the world in both directions. She knows only too well what is needed to complete a solo circumnavigation. There's no other event that goes on for as long as it does as sailing around the world. And to do that day in, day out, no matter what's going on, um, shows a huge level of, of strength. Ultimately, you have to remember why you're out there. And for me, I, I absolutely love it. It's the most hostile environment, but it's also some of the best sailing you do. And I think it's that reason why we all keep going back out there um, is because we love it. We love the fact that we have endless horizons for sunrises and sunsets. We see nature in its natural environment. We see the strength and the power of mother nature definitely telling us she's in charge. And we're trying to harness this power and make it work for ourselves. The more I, I heard about it, uh, the more I, I understood the enormous danger and complexity of what he did. And the, you could only imagine the drive that kept him going. I just don't think there's anything very much in, in, in the years that have followed that to match that achievement. I think it was absolutely magnificent. Robin Knox Johnston was one of nine sailors who began the Golden Globe race in 1968. The route for this circumnavigation is a logical one, as it's similar to that of olden day clipper sailing ships, which, loaded with goods to trade with, ran with the favourable winds as fast as they could. 
with a start off southwest England, it's straight down the Atlantic and round South Africa. Then across the Southern Ocean, onto Australia, New Zealand and across to the infamous Cape Horn, rounding the tip of South America. And then all the way back up the Atlantic to the finish. In the late 1960s, there was little precedent for how long this new race might take. Francis Chichester had completed his voyage in nine months with a stop, but no one knew for certain if the human body and mind could cope with the stresses of sailing the route non-stop and alone. I wanted sponsorship so I could build a much bigger boat, faster boat. I wanted to build a 56-footer, which Colin Moody did design for me, and I needed about two and a half, three thousand to build her out of steel. And the rest of the money would have gone on things like radios and food and stuff. That's why I needed five thousand pounds. Anyway, I couldn't raise it, so I I got Sue Haley. I was trying to sell her, but no one was interested, so I thought, well, I've got a boat, I'll take that. But I was going. I mean, there was no argument about it. Robin was now totally focused with plans for the looming race. There were nine people intent on undertaking this circumnavigation, with the favourite being Bernard Matissier from France. Robin was generally regarded as the underdog by the media, and in this pioneering age, the public were now taking great interest as plans for the race evolved. I didn't think I was the underdog um, at all. I mean, I thought, actually, I'm probably one of the best prepared here. I know this boat inside out. I'm a professional seaman, I'm a navigator by profession. I'm better prepared for this voyage than anyone, probably except Matessier. So the comments about me being the underdog really were just a, an annoyance. The media, particularly the Sunday Times, wrote me off completely. Um, but, you know, they didn't delve into it. They didn't stop and think. The editor of Yachting World did. He looked at it and said, hang on, look what this chap's done. He's pretty experienced. On the 14th of June, 1968, Robin set off from Falmouth in Cornwall on a voyage that was destined to change his life and that of many others. His concerned family were there to see him leave. Robin's younger brother recalls his departure. My father was a very emotional man and uh, immensely proud of what he was trying to do, but very scared, I think. Um, my mother just kept a brave face, but uh, it, I think it was tough for them, very tough. I don't remember what the words are. I remember looking at my mother's face, it was very drawn. I didn't like that. And Dad was looking a bit worried. My brother Mike was there as well. And, uh, but you know, um, you're, you're gonna have that moment, aren't you? You're gonna have to go through that moment. I mean, it's gonna be there, whatever you do. At some point, I've gotta head out. So, um, Frankly, the sooner I get out to sea and I can put those thoughts behind me, the better, and focus on the job in hand. I mean, it's their eldest son going to do this uh, incredible adventure. And uh, they, they, you know, I remember that evening after he'd gone, it was pretty quiet. It wasn't a, a celebration or anything like that. It was really a really quiet time. I think probably it dawned on me, you know, was this, am I going to see you again? And one by one, over a period of weeks, they left in their small yachts, heading out into the unknown, isolated and alone, set on a non-stop circumnavigation of the planet. Since that first race over 50 years ago, the yachts have become larger and faster, with ever-improving technology enabling a lighter construction. Today's sailors are now used to managing extraordinary speeds over the oceans. It's still an incredible challenge to circumnavigate the world, but records continue to tumble. In late 2018, the single-handed circumnavigation world record stood at an astonishing 42 days, 16 hours, 40 minutes and 35 seconds, set by Frenchman Francois Gabard on his 100-foot trimaran. That's eight months faster than Robin's achievement. It's a world apart from the tools used in the 1968 race. The radio used to be here. Marconi Kestrel, and that's the only communication I had. I mean, nowadays I've got a VHF, um, I've got a direction finder, didn't have that in those days, which also gives me a long wave so I can get weather forecasts. Um, obviously, you've got a, a clock, you've got a barometer, and they're new, but the Guinness one is the one that was given me by the pub in Down before I set sail, and frankly, it was absolutely invaluable. It's 
only scientific instrument I had on board, apart from the sextant, and absolutely vital information that let me know when this depression was coming through. Nowadays I have two different types of satellite phones. I've got a tracker, I've got probably 10 GPSs, um, five other different emergency devices. You know, I, I can be in contact all the time. If I want to video conference my kid at school, in theory, I could. I, I'd like to think today you don't necessarily feel lonely, but you could feel isolated. Whereas back when Robin did it, obviously there was no communication, so you'd have the loneliness and the isolation. People forget that without satellites, there's no GPS. We didn't have that. What we have is a sextant, which was used for measuring the height of a body, a celestial body above the horizon, and the time. And armed with that information, we could then work out a position line. It's just a line. If you take a sight of the sun in the morning, your line is going to be perpendicular to the bearing of the sun. So my line now is actually, if I get it right, a line of longitude. I then wait till midday when the sun is at its maximum height and I take that reading. That's a much simpler calculation and that will give me a latitude. In between taking those two sides and cross it with the latitude, I've got a fix. And that's how we used to know it. Exactly the same way as Captain Cook did 250 years ago. Another great British navigator and tactician is Sir Ben Ainsley the most successful Olympic sailor of all time, with four gold medals and a silver. Over the years, he and Robin have become great friends, and as Ben embarks on a major British challenge for the America's Cup trophy, the technological advances he has at his disposal are the best in the world. Well, I think the tactics and strategy in the Golden Globe race were, again, were, were amazing considering the lack of aids, navigational aids, tactical aids that were available compared with what we have these days. It's really a walk in a park in comparison. Not having any weather routing, for example. So having to really use um, that seaman's intuition, if you like, seafarer's intuition, of what the wind would do next, what the ocean currents were doing, dealing with all of that with no backup or support. Uh, again, that just highlights what an amazing achievement it was. Robin's great adventure was underway in June 1968, making his way south from the UK, where he began not only keeping a ship's log, but a diary too, noting that others in the race were about to start their own journey behind him. 19th July 1968, day 35. The alarm woke me at 0430 for my radio call to Bruce at 0500. Got through without difficulty and had quite a good circuit considering the range is nearly 3,000 miles. Of Ridgeway and Blythe, there's no news. I'm keeping a good lookout for them. King and Matessi plan to start in about a fortnight. Those two worry me, as both have larger boats than Suheli. I will only have seven weeks' start. I can't afford to hang about. But as he progressed down through the Atlantic, not only was he suffering from a bout of jaundice, but he was facing mounting issues with the stresses of the open ocean on Suheili. Well, the first problem was the boat was leaking quite a lot. And so I had to take all the sails down as I got towards the equator and do some repairs in the water. And I tacked a strip of copper along the leaking seam. And it took about two days because I could only put one tack in between getting some more air. So I'd get a deep breath of air, dive down, put a tack in, come back up, pick up another tack, take a deep breath down, put another one in, and um, it was going fine until the shark came along and um, wouldn't go away. So that was annoying me, because it's distracting. You know, you don't know at what point he might decide he likes my look at my legs. So I climbed out of the water and he wouldn't go away, so I threw some lavatory paper in the water. And of course they're scavengers. And as he came to the surface to bite the lavatory paper, I shot him. Watched him sink and waited. And waited for about half an hour. And no other sharks turned up, so I was able to go over the side and finish the job. This no-nonsense defiance not only helped Robin complete the race in 1969, but has set the tone for other achievements throughout his life, often joining together with others in new adventures. Sir Chris Bonington created a reputation as the UK's leading mountaineer, 
becoming a world-leading authority on the sport. He's also worked on many projects with Robin and recalls his pioneering spirit. I think the whole Golden Globe race, if you like, was fascinating. There were a lot of sailors who wanted to be the first person to sail around the world non-stop, single-handed. Robin, in some ways, was one of the less experienced long-distance sailors going in for it. His boat was undoubtedly the slowest boat. And he, I think, just, he just wanted to do it. And he wasn't trying to, make, in fact, break any records. He was interested in just doing it. He wasn't racing. He just kept going. Twenty second September nineteen sixty eight, day a hundred. Last day of southern winter. I woke to find I was heading north, so got up and jibed. Banged my elbow badly during the night, and what with that, numerous other bruises and an eye that throbbed, I felt as if I had just gone through ten rounds with Cassius Clay. As the wind was down, I let out some sail and then went back to bed. It's warm and reasonably dry there, and I feel very tired. After almost three months, Robin had sailed the length of the Atlantic and was rounding the Cape of Good Hope off of South Africa. His pace was not quick, however, and the others who started later than he did were evidently closing on him. But next was the infamous Southern Ocean and down into the roaring 40s. Southern Ocean is some of the best sailing you can do. It's the most hostile environment, rescue is not possible, and you're pretty much out there on your own but it's also some of the best sailing you do. The swells here can be massive and the storms unforgiving. And so it proved when Suheili was knocked flat in one of the many ferocious storms with life-threatening consequences for Robin. I had six gales in the first 10 days in the Southern Ocean, including the one that knocked the boat right over. And that's when I lost my fresh water and damaged the self-steering. I had a spare for the self-steering. Water was a different problem. And I looked at what I got on board, and I still had about 110 cans of beer. And I thought, well, if I drink three or four of those a day, I've got enough liquid to keep my body going, and that would get me level with Australia. And in the meantime, I'll see what I can capture in the sails from the rain. But then, once I got into the Southern Ocean, we're dealing with a very, very different type of wave, much, much bigger. And when she was lying broadside onto them, they were hitting her. I mean, it was like an anvil being swung against the hull. I mean, terrible cracking noise. And also just pushing her over. I mean, it was very jerky. And I realized she couldn't take that for long. I had to do something about it. And I got out this long length of rope I bought, last minute uh, purchase. I think it cost 16 pounds. Probably my best ever investment. And I just put it out, made it fast up the front, and put one side out here huge great loop round the back and then brought it back in this side. And that had us a break and Saheli just swung straight down wave. And of course with this canoe stern here, Norwegian stern, she was very comfortable because she just rode it. So actually, very quickly I realized when I got to those conditions, but nothing I can do but go to sleep, get some rest. While Robin and the others were battling their way across the world's oceans, astronauts were defying gravity and leaving the planet behind them. The crew of Apollo 8 carved their names in history when they achieved an orbit of the moon for the first time, followed in 1969 by the moon landings. These were remarkable achievements celebrated worldwide. Only later, when Robin completed his circumnavigation, were these milestones for mankind compared. 1969 was a real golden year for the idea of sort of um, moving the boundaries, of showing that the kind of things we'd always assumed controlled us and limited us didn't necessarily have to control us or limit us anymore. They were magnificent, those American astronauts, but it was all planned out terribly carefully with their safety very, very much in mind. Robin didn't have that. He was on his own in a boat that he mostly built by himself. You're looking good here. Okay, we're gonna be busy for a minute. 
it's easy to put in perspective what Robin did, because at that time, they put a man on the moon, and yet they thought it was impossible for someone to sail solo non-stop around the world. So in 68, 69, they equated sailing solo non-stop around the world the same as putting a man on the moon. So that, that tells you how difficult it was. But Robin's radio wasn't installed by NASA. And back in 1968, now four months into the Golden Globe race, he had encountered more difficulties. Nearing Australia, he'd gone two months without any communication after his only radio had become damp. And unable to transmit, rumors were spreading that disaster had overtaken him. Once the radio broke down, that had it. Um, and it was so frustrating because the receiver still worked and I could hear them calling me, and I couldn't respond to them, and because they weren't telling me what was going on. They could have sort of said, by the way, this is happening. So I really knew nothing about what was happening with the others. Off of Melbourne, Robin engaged with a pilot vessel and asked them to take his mail, explaining he was 147 days out from the UK. Eventually, they agreed, and the world knew that he was still alive and still going. But by now, of the nine sailors that had begun this great adventure, only Robin and three others were still in the race, as the rest had either given up or been forced to retire through breakages. After passing New Zealand, he faced the fearsome Pacific Ocean, thousands of miles of solitude. Well, the main problem with the Pacific was um, the weather turned on me. Um, I got a lot of easterlies, which slowed me up. And I was very conscious of the Frenchman. Off New Zealand, they told me that he was um, about four weeks behind me. So I thought, this isn't looking bad at all. And I got these easterlies, and I must have lost nearly 10 days in the Pacific. Um, it was extremely frustrating. I ran into a ferocious storm. That's when the waves swamped the boat when I was on deck. And uh, I climbed the mast. I was getting away, stopped being washed off. Not nice. When you see a down big wave coming towards the boat and you're shinning up the mast, hanging onto a wire, you have no idea how high that wave's gonna be when it goes over the boat. Is it gonna wash me off from up here? I just don't know. And then the wave hits and the whole boat disappears. When you're hanging onto this mast, looking down at water because the boats are, you know, it's underwater. And eventually, it seems after ages, it pops up. And, uh, oh, good. But for a while, there's you and two miles and nothing in sight for 1,500 miles in any direction. That is why there's only about 230 people who sailed around the world single-handed. In late 1968, Robin was still grimly battling his way across the Pacific. His last contact was with fishermen off New Zealand, and with weeks passing with no word from him, he was again regarded as missing and fears increased. The vital information that his radio was unable to transmit had not been passed on. The rumours were, of course, difficult. You know, people wanted to see the worst, or oh, he won't make it, he's gone, he's had it, you know, the boat's come apart. There was all these rumours going around. I suppose we, until we could have it confirmed that there was, we didn't know what was, that his radio didn't work or anything else like that. We, we just thought uh, maybe he just decided to keep quiet for a while. After sailing for 217 days, he was actually approaching the infamous Cape Horn at the southern tip of South America, where countless ships have met their end due to frequent raging storms. This is the final major cape to round in the race. He had now been alone at sea for more than seven months, and nobody knew where he was or even if he was still alive. 17th of January, 1969, day 218. The wind died this afternoon. I've had a lot of sail up at the moment. However, a dark cloud is forming to windward, and I can see rain falling on the land, so I'll probably have to reduce sail shortly. It was a short rain squall, and when it lifted, I could plainly see the two tower rocks that make the southwest of the Cape of Hornus. We've passed it. Cape Horn is just another day. Yes, it's a big one, because once you've passed it, you're still going to have to go on in the Southern Ocean a bit longer. But eventually, you're going to turn north, and you're going to lose that swell. 
that's been rolling your boat for the last five months. Everyone talks about Cape Horn and these huge waves. I'm sitting there, I can see the ominous black clouds over the land. I think there's something on its way. This is not the place to hang around, and the current's just quietly drifting me past. But there was still almost another three months to survive out in the Atlantic Ocean, and up through the dreaded doldrums area for the second time. Robin refocused, determined to see it through, concentrating his efforts. At the time of the race, a non-stop circumnavigation like this had never been achieved. It was the ultimate test in sailing, demanding extraordinary physical and mental willpower. Later in life, this determination, skill and resolve enabled him to successfully develop his career and eventually led to the spark of an idea that has subsequently created new opportunities and changed thousands of people's lives forever. Robin could never have imagined the legacy he would create later in life as he passed 300 days at sea during his circumnavigation in 1969. Finally, after months of silence, missing and presumed lost at sea, Robin had been sighted, heading for home. I had no idea where anyone else was until about a week from my finish. Nothing on the radio at all. And it was actually a French boat that came over and I, I called him up um, at the lamp and asked him to report me to Lloyd's because I didn't know if I'd been reported by the other ship. He said, yes, you are missing. A very strange answer. Um, then I said, where is Matissier? He said, in the Indian Ocean. I said, no way is in the Indian Ocean. He must be very close to me. And they tried to make me slow up. Um, but in fact, of course, he was. But... Um, and I suddenly realised, oh, I've done it. I've got a week to go. All I've got to do is get through the fishing fleets and get to Falmouth, and we've done it. We all got down to Falmouth. My brothers and I were, were all on a, a Navy minesweeper that went out to, to, to track him. My parents were on another ship. Um, we found him, um, and we were sort of partnering him coming up the channel, or the outer reaches of the channel. Other boats were getting around and starting to keep him company during this, uh, this last sort of 24, 36 hours. First of all, it made me slow down. I could have finished in the morning. Um, I'd passed the lizard. I was coming up and they said, what time are you going to finish? It's about nine o'clock. They told me to slow down because the Mary Maris wouldn't be ready because she was coming her hair done. So I slowed down. The wind changed. I didn't actually finish at 3.20 in the afternoon, by which time the poor dear's hairstyle was ruined anyway. So I'm trying to head up for the finish line. The Sunday Times decided it's different to what I thought it was. That leads to another bit of argument. And eventually I cross the finish line and um, about 20 past three. Day 312, about 25 past three on April the 22nd. And Robin Knox Johnson and Sue Haley have sailed non-stop around the world. Eventually came in mooring and took me ashore in a bit. And of course, the first thing is I didn't know if I could walk or not. So I sort of stood there, sort of feeling my legs, see if I could stand up all right. Found I could, but I couldn't walk very far. Not more than 200 yards, my ankles wouldn't take it. The welcome was much bigger than I think any of us expected it to be. And he, uh, I think it took him a little bit of time to get used to what was going on. He knew he had responsibilities. He sort of got his minds ready for that. I, even then, I don't think he was, he was ready for everything that happened in those sort of few days afterwards and, and certainly for the next few months. I mean, dreaming for a long time about what the first thing I'd do when I got ashore, thinking, you know, there's going to be no fuss anyway. So I'll just go to a pub and I'll get myself a pint of beer, a steak, and then I'll have a bath because that was, those seemed to me to be the priorities. I wasn't aware of the fact there was going to be all this fuss when I got back. So it actually took me a while before I got any of them. I, I'm afraid I'm a little bit overwhelmed by the reception. Um, excuse my hoarse voice. <laughs> Very much appreciate seeing so many people here. And uh, thank you very much indeed for your reception. <laughs> After 
After finishing the race first, Robin entered a new world, with the glare of publicity focused on him. He wrote a book about his incredible voyage, which earned him considerable royalties. Such was his newfound fame. That involved a UK book tour and countless speaking engagements. He was also invited to Buckingham Palace and bestowed the honour of being made a commander of the British Empire for his sailing achievement, a CBE. That same year, he was also named as the Yachtsman of the Year by the Yachting Journalists Association. Now in the public eye with such demands on his time, he left the Merchant Navy for roles where his knowledge and experience were invaluable. That included the design and build of a new marina on the Hamble, on England's south coast, and then in London with the development of St Catherine's Dock. Over the next few years, he became reconciled with Sue and they remarried in 1972, moving to the south coast where they settled into a new life. However, his daughter Sarah recalls how her father would often be away from home for long periods as his career blossomed. My earliest memories are this just rather lovely, huge man used to turn up um, because he was in the Navy and so I didn't see him every day. And uh, I do remember putting my hand inside his hand and the, the feel of his palms. It was like holding hands with Pinocchio. Incredibly hard skin and it was fascinating. Growing up with dad, going off and doing these things, um, it wasn't too worrying because I knew how very expert, he hates that word, um, very, very good he, he was and still is at what he chooses to do. It must have been worse for mum, but she, she seemed to accept it. She'd known him since she was six. Um, it, you just have to accept it. And you can't hold someone back. You must never hold someone back. Mum used to say, what, would, what he would have been like if he hadn't done the round the world in, in 68, 69, I dread to think. I'm very proud of him, yeah, because if you sailed on Sue Haley, you know, incredibly special as she is, she's not comfortable. Um, she's really designed for one person to sail her. Um, and I'm, yes, I'm very proud of what he's achieved. Robin Knox Johnston became the first man to sail non-stop and alone around the world in 1969. It was an incredible achievement that earned him worldwide fame and recognition, but this was only the start of what would become a glittering career. Robin continued racing professionally, sought after as a navigator and tactician. He was involved in winning a round Britain race for the first time in 1970 took line honours in the 1971 Cape to Rio race, and then another circumnavigation joining a team in the second Whitbread round the world race, with Robin winning the legs he skippered. His success continued, the allure of achievement as strong as ever, and in 1993, together with famed sailor Peter Blake from New Zealand, they set off to attempt the Transat Jules Verne record, attempting the fastest circumnavigation ever. But they failed. The huge catamaran hit a submerged object, tearing a hole in the hull. A year later, they tried again, and this time succeeded, establishing a new world record of 74 days, 22 hours, 18 minutes and 22 seconds. Yet another remarkable achievement. After this new success, receiving his second Yachtsman of the Year award, he was recalled to Buckingham Palace to receive a knighthood in recognition of his achievements in sailing and was forevermore to be known as Sir Robin Knox Johnston. In 2007, now 68 years old, Robin took on another great challenge, competing in the Velux Five Oceans race, circumnavigating the world alone again, finishing fourth in 159 days. His third Yachtsman of the Year award followed, and he continued his racing career from there, taking third in his class for transatlantic race on his huge open 60-foot yacht called Grey Power, sailing it single-handedly aged 75. The story of the first Golden Globe race in Jaws, even after 50 years, as it affected the lives of everyone involved. And there was also heartbreak too. Of the nine that started, Robin was the only one to finish. 
but it's now known that Donald Crowhurst had falsified his reports and updates during the race to give the impression he had sailed further than he actually had. His yacht was found drifting and abandoned in the Atlantic Ocean after the race as the lies unraveled. Donald's son recalls hearing the news about his father's yacht. I remember the day that my mother having spoken to two to nuns who walked, walked down our drive and came to see her, took us upstairs to, told us that my father's boat had been found, but that he wasn't on it. Uh, and then she, she broke down in tears. We tried to sort of console her and reassure her that um, we were sure he'd be all right and, and, and that he'd be fine. Uh, but uh, that was, that was when, when I heard that news. With the tragedy unfolding, the family were in financial crisis too, as their house had been mortgaged to build Donald's yacht. When Robin heard about this, he immediately donated his £5,000 winnings to the Crowhurst family. Look, they were about to lose their house. Um, there were four kids, the oldest was 12, going through a tough enough time as it is. I never expected to win it. And, you know, I've got good advance on the book, don't need it all. And I had no idea what I was going to do next anyway at that time. I was just concerned that these kids didn't lose their house. I don't remember seeing my mother's reaction to when she heard about uh, the prize money being given to our family, but things lightened from that point and the, the darkness was not certainly not quite as dark and there, there did seem to be a way ahead. Although Robin was the first to finish, for many years there was speculation that Frenchman Bernard Matissier could possibly have been faster or even beaten him home, as after rounding Cape Horn, Matissier gave up and continued on to Tahiti instead of heading to the finish. Recently discovered in Robin's archive, long forgotten, is a letter written from the Frenchman in 1981, congratulating his rival, recognizing that he was not leading the race at the time and didn't know whether he could have won or not. To mark the 50th anniversary of Robin's achievement, a weekend of celebrations in Falmouth were planned to commemorate his finishing the Golden Globe race in 1969. Together with friends and family, he sailed Suheili along the south coast to a wonderfully warm reception. His footprints have been immortalised on the dockside to remember his achievements. And 50 years to the day, a flotilla was out to accompany him and Suheili as they set about recreating that historic finish after 312 days at sea on the 22nd of April at 3.25 in the afternoon. Day 312, about 25 past three on April the 22nd, and Robin Knox Johnson and Suheili have sailed non-stop around the world. he stepped ashore at the Royal Cornwall Yacht Club, just as he did before, to a hero's welcome once again. This is fantastic for my sport of sailing. All these people out there just enjoying the day out, celebrating something that happened 50 years ago, which I suppose we Brits should be proud of because we did it first, one way or another. But it was just fantastic. Looking back, I just thought, lovely. Robin's imagination and thirst for adventure saw him take on many more challenges through his life. And on one such journey, the spark of an idea came to him it has led to a remarkable achievement in opening up the sport to everyone on the planet. I was in Greenland with Chris Bonington climbing, and um, he was telling me about climbing Mount Everest. He told me how much it cost. I thought, well, what's the sailing equivalent to Mount Everest? Circumnavigation. Well, there must be people out there who'd love to do that, but can't afford a boat or 
have got a boat but haven't got confidence to do it. Supposing we got the boat, we'll skip her. How much would I have to charge those people to let them go around the world? And it came out about half what it cost to climb Mount Everest. Robin's plans were in their infancy, but then he was introduced to a businessman who became inspired by his vision. First time I met Robin was in the summer of 95, and it was when he wanted to get the Clipper race underway. It was through a friend of a friend, and would I invest in, in the business? And uh, the long and the short of that is after meeting Robin, growing to know him, and over the course of the next few months, uh, invested with him, and uh, we formed Clipper Race. From the start of the idea to starting the first race was 11 months. During that time, we had to recruit crews, interview them, build boats, select skippers, train the crews, work out the route. And it was a very busy 11 months, but we did it. The actual thing that convinced me, once I decided that I thought he was a good guy and would stand his corner, but was actually reading the application forms and the passion to do, to follow his footsteps, that was the thing that turned me. The Clipper race has continually evolved over more than 20 years and is firmly established as the only opportunity for complete amateurs to firstly learn how to sail, but then to go on and sail around the world. Over 5,000 people have taken part so far as it continues to grow now with 11 circumnavigations completed. At the time, I don't think we really knew what it, we were doing uh, as far as, you know, it was the, one hell of an adventure to start with eight boats, eight skippers, no staff whatsoever, and two, two in the office, and me and Robin. So we were repairers, PR, everything. It, uh, it was uh, really sort of taking the bull by the horns, which, again, if you wanted a better partner to do something, uh, you couldn't get better than Robin to do that with. His sailing knowledge, his impact, ideas and innovation, his ability to inspire, lead and teach others is legendary. And his vision has enabled thousands of people to take up the sport and transform their lives forever. I think his biggest legacy will be, probably be Clip Adventures in the end. I mean, sailing, being the first person to sail non-stop around the world, you'll never take that away from him, but he has introduced so many people into our sport that it'd be very hard to quantify what our landscape would be like without him. As a person, he's a guy that stands to with you under any circumstances. I can't think of a more man mountain than, than Robin. You'd want on your side at anything you were doing. If you were down, he lifts you up, and that's really important as a business partner and as a mate. Robin, by opening up the, the, the whole idea of, of, of sailing around the world, you know, and, not, not keeping it as a little something that only he and a couple of others have done, but to say to, 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 to a broad uh, audience of people, you can do it, we can help you, but you yourself possess the ability to do this kind of thing, just as I do. Sir Robin Knox Johnson is really the complete sailor, um, you know, going back to Golden Globe success, uh, Jules Verne, uh, record successes, but you know, biggest thing for me probably, uh, despite all of that, is the fact he's still racing competitively at, at 80 years old. And that's a massive inspiration. I, I really hope that I can be sailing like he is at 80 years old. Sir Robin is a legend. He, he encompasses everything that has built our sport to what it is today. Um, and I think people probably underestimate or don't even realise just how involved he's been in so many aspects of our sport. His achievement inspired generations to follow in his footsteps. There's no question uh, that winning the Golden Globe changed my life completely. But meeting William Ward was probably one of the best things that's happened in my life. And we, we were able to put this idea together and make it happen. I think the Clipper Race has been one of those things that has brought so much benefit to so many people, changed their lives dramatically. They're proud, they've done something special with their lives. So I think William and I getting Clipper up and going and, 
and keeping it running has been perhaps one of the most satisfying things I've done. Robin and his famous yacht Sue Haley have lived their lives entwined together. Now 80 years old, Robin is considering the future for both of them. Sue Haley is a personal friend. Um, she's been, well, part of my life since I was 24 years old when I saw her keel, the log for her keel coming to the yard in Bombay. And so, I'm very, very fond of her. Um, you know, she's very special to me. Sometime you have to realize that we're gonna drop off this mortal coil and um, find somewhere for her to go where she'd be perhaps respected and looked after. The alternative, of course, would be to have a Viking funeral. But Robin is still going strong in business and with his plans for more adventures. I do want to get back up to the Arctic so we can carry on diving under icebergs and looking at some of the most fantastic scenery there is on this planet. So at some stage, I shall wander north again.